Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I'm continuing along my processing journey here, trying to tighten up the ship a little bit. And one of the things that I'm looking at today is how do we include RGB stars, meaning an image that we've collected by specifically using the RGB filter to collect data for the stars only, not into the background. Now you want to add those stars that have been properly calibrated with photometric color calibration tool, for example, back into your galaxy image or your nebula image. And there's a wrong way to do this and possibly many right ways to do this, but I've been using the wrong way and I want to share with you what I've been doing to try to do a better job of capturing this star field in my SHO images. Let's get started. Once I get into the nonlinear phase of image processing, I will remove the stars. And for a nebula image such as this, which is SH286, I remove the SHO stars out of the image and then continue processing the image to bring up the brightness and detail within the nebulosity. But during the data collection period, I will also collect about 30 minutes to 60 minutes per RGB filter in order to get an image of stars only that I can, once I'm done processing the nebula image, just add and affect the stars to the image. Now the question is, how does one go about doing this? Well, what I've been doing is simply that, adding the stars to this image. I've been using a simple pixel math expression where I take the image called stars that only has the stars in it and add it to the image of the nebula, which has no stars. And when I do that, I end up with something that looks like this, which frankly is not at all what I was looking for. All of these stars are white. They tend to be bloated. And in fact, they're white because they're saturated. Simply adding RGB stars to an enhanced field of nebulosity causes you to lose the calibrated star color probably will lead to saturation and on into bloated stars. Let's take a look at why that happens. Here we have the nebula image and say one pixel out of that nebula image has some mix of red, green, and blue based on how we did our processing. Now I can do the same thing with the star image. I've collected the data with my RGB filters. I've extracted the stars using StarNet. I've calibrated the stars using photometric color calibration. And so now I've got a pretty good definition of what the star colors are. And I just want to add them back into my nebulosity so that I have an accurate representation of stars along with the not so accurate, but very enhanced image of the nebulosity. We start off with the SHO pixel color and then we add the RGB colors to it. And two bad things happen when we do this. In general, we're going to get some saturation across the color spectrum. So R, G, and B will all be saturated. In this particular example, I'm only showing that the red pixels are saturated. But the next thing we have, you can see this proportion of red to green and green to blue is not the red to green and green to blue proportions that we had in our stars. So in other words, we have lost the star color if we have star color at all. So that's why we're ending up with a picture that looks like this. We need an alternate method that allows us to retain the star color and try to avoid saturating the image. Now in this star field, when I zoom in, there's quite a few details in here that I'd like to retain. First of all, there's a grouping of many stars in here, and you can see the separation between the stars, a lot of good detail. There's some color in some of these orange stars that I'm getting, and I imagine quite a few of these fairly bright stars are in fact saturated, so I probably need to cut down on my 50 second exposure time that I'm using to capture the RGB data. But I'd like for this star field to be represented in the combined nebula image. And as you can see, I'm not getting that at all. I need to replace the pixels in the nebula image with the pixels in the star image, not add the two images together. So this is a fairly simple process. Here we start off with the SHO pixel again with our red, green, and blue, however it's mixed together for a given pixel in the nebula starless image. And we have some color in that pixel that is the maximum. Maybe it's the red, maybe it's the green, maybe it's the blue. In this case, the red has the highest value. So I identify that with the variable named LN. And we do the same thing with the stars only image. And once again, we identify the maximum color entry. And here again, in this example, I've picked the red color as being a higher value than the green or the blue, and that is LS. And now when LS, the maximum color in the star pixel is greater than the maximum color in the nebula pixel, I just cop the red, the green, and the blue into that pixel and effectively replace or throw out the color mix that I had in that nebula pixel before. On the other hand, much of the space in the star image is background space. It's 
either close to the rim or the edge of a star, or it's some point that is just pure noise between stars. And in that case, LS is less than LN, and so there I just keep the nebula pixel color. So it's a fairly simple process, but this process will maintain the star color and it will avoid the saturation problem that we're having when we try to add the star colors directly on top of the SHO pixel colors. Let's take a look at the pixel math expressions to do this. And the first thing we want to do is to check this box here because we're going to be putting code in each of the red tab, the green tab, and the blue tabs. Now the first thing I do is go to the target image, which is the nebula image, and pull out the red, the green, and the blue for a given pixel in that image. We're going to drag this triangle over to the nebula image that has no stars, and that will be by definition dollar sign $t or the target image. And then we're going to find the maximum value of one of those colors. Is it the red, the green, or the blue? Whichever is the maximum value, that will represent that pixel for the nebula image. Then we're going to repeat the same process with the stars image. Now in this case, I've taken the stars only image has been renamed to be stars. So then we'll go to the stars image and pull out the red and the green and the blue for the same pixel that we just pulled out the red, green, and blue from the nebula image and again we're going to get the maximum value of the red the green and the blue in the star pixel the value for the red channel is selected based on which pixel the star pixel or the nebula pixel has the brightest color element to it if the brightest color pixel in the star image is greater than the maximum color pixel in the nebula image then that pixel in the nebula image will simply be set to the red value from the star image otherwise where the nebula pixels are brighter than the star image pixels will retain the red color from the nebula image now I'm going to put these lines into the description of the video, copy them over to the green and the blue tabs up here, and then in the green tab replace the R with the G, and in the blue tab replace the R with the B, and you'll be good to go. Now let's go over to the symbol area and talk about what the scale factor is. If scale is less than 1, the star will appear to be somewhat larger, but you have a bit of a risk that there's going to be a pixel boundary around the star that is darker than the star and darker than the nebula, and so you may get what appears to be a dark band around the star. If that shows up too much or it's too distracting for you, then set scale equal to 1, and then that will maximize the star size, but prevent a dark boundary around the star. And then finally, if you really want to get more of an abrupt brightness shift from the nebula to the star, use a scale factor greater than one, which will probably settle very quickly on a value equal or very close to one. Let's go over to PixInsight and see how this works. Okay, so here we have our starless image and we have nebulosity throughout the field of view here. Once again, this is SH286, and here we have the RGB stars color calibrated with photometric color calibration and removed from the background using StarNet. And we just want to include this star field into our starless nebula image. Let's use the addition process that we've looked at and just see what happens if we do that. And if I just execute that, I have a new star image. And this is basically what I've been getting. We zoom in to the same field of view that we're looking at here on the right. This is what I'm getting. None of this detail is present in this image over here because the stars are bloated because of the saturation that is present around all the stars. So what I've done over here is to create some images with uh, different levels of brightness, just grayscale images. And then I've combined these using color calibration to get a either a blue image or an orange image, just for the sake of having a uniform field where we're not distracted by the variation in nebulosity around the star. We can just look at how the stars are combined into a uniform color image. Then we can apply that method to the actual nebula image. Let's use the uniform blue field in order to test out our pixel mass script here. Now I've got a number of orange stars here, which might be difficult to pull out relative to a orange background. So the blue background might be a little easier for us to see what's going on as we play with the scale parameters. So I'm going to call up the script that we just looked at and you can see here that the scale value is equal to 0.8. Let's turn that down just so you get an idea of what's happening here. Let's turn that down to 0.7 for example. And So let's run this and see what happens. Okay so here's our stars image. I'm going to slide this out of the way and let's make the views the same so that we can see what's going on in a close-up. 
And now you can see that we have a slightly darkish band going around the star. Not really evident when you look at it in full field like that. And not terribly evident when you look at it on a pixel by pixel basis, but it is there. And the brighter the background, the more obvious will be the difference. And so if, when we zoom in, we can actually see that we're getting that effect. Right here, this pixel layer, maybe two pixel layers around these stars is actually coming through as a dark band. And as you can see here, there is this zone between these stars here that I'm not fully getting because I'm letting some of that dark uh, region come to the forefront and I'm not letting the nebula pixels penetrate into this zone between these two stars. So that's what happens when you use a small value of scale. Let's crank that up to one and see what happens. I'm going to rerun this and we get our now combined image with the nebulosity blue field combined with our stars. Let's go ahead and zoom in again and see how that changing the scale parameter has affected things. Now you can see wherever the nebula, in this case the blue field, the blue color, is brighter than the brightest color in the star field, the blue color controls and we get the blue color coming in and around our stars. And as a result, we're able to see the nebulosity between these stars instead of getting a kind of a dull gray background. Let's look at the image at the one to one pixel scale. That looks like what we were after. We have these stars here that are orange and we're certainly getting the same exact pixels because we just copied these pixels over here. So like these two stars here, for example, are being copied verbatim, so to speak, into this image. Now, some of these smaller stars, the, the very uh, dim stars, we may be losing those altogether. For example, this star right here is not going to be in the nebula image because the nebulosity is brighter than this star. So using this scale factor equal to one, let's apply this to our nebula. And once again, we're just going to do a drag and drop operation and wait for it to do the computations. And there's the finished image. Now it doesn't look all that different. It certainly doesn't look like the image we started off with when we were adding the images together. You might wonder if you put the stars in the image at all, but you can see down here in the darker regions, the stars are definitely there. Let's go through and look at this particular field close up and see what we have. So now we can see that we're getting these stars. We're getting the detail around the stars. We don't have a smooth transition into the star because the nebulosity in our enhanced nebula region is brighter than the star image around the edge of the star. So as a result, we're getting a bright nebulosity going directly from that into the bright star. We are getting the star color that we have in some of these stars, but we're going to lose some really faint stars because the nebulosity in the nebula region is now brighter than these fainter stars that we have in our star image. We're not getting the bloating and we're not getting a color shift where we actually have star color. The method that I had been using for a long time is fairly simple minded in that I'd just been adding a star field to a starless nebula field. And as a result, I'm losing the color in the stars. I'm causing uh, saturation and bloating of those stars, which is very distracting when you look at the image. I would have preferred to have a algorithm that works on a star by star basis. So it would identify a star and work to incorporate that star into the nebula image, taking advantage of the geometry of the star. That's a fairly difficult, if not impossible thing to implement. So I adopted a much simpler approach by just working pixel by pixel. So this simple-minded method that I'm using here simply takes the star pixel and replaces the nebula pixel when the star pixel has the brightest color relative to that same pixel in the nebula image. If the nebula image has the brightest color, then I retain the nebula pixel. Fainter stars will be lost in this process because they simply won't be bright enough to overcome the brightness of the nebula. I think you'll find, as I have, that a scale parameter probably equal to one is the best way to go. That way you don't end up with a dark boundary around the stars and you're able to get nebulosity in between closely spaced stars. And when you apply this procedure to a fairly brightened area of nebulosity, you may feel like you've lost all the stars. And in fact, by not saturating the stars, you'll find that the stars that you are incorporating into your nebula image are much less noticeable than they were when we were just adding the stars to the nebula image, which resulted in a larger bloated saturated star, which were very obvious. So maybe that's not such a bad thing. This approach does retain the star color and does not cause any additional saturation. Now, whether you like the results or not, that's up to you. Okay, guys, well, that's all I've got for now. 
I'll talk to you later. Clear skies, and remember, put those stars in your images.